It's always game day in Cleveland. Bonus edition. I'm Daryl Ryder as we get you ready for the 2023 Lid Lifter Sunday afternoon at Cleveland Brown Stadium. To preview this week's opponent, the Cincinnati Bengals. We welcome your, our good friend. He is the publisher of All Bengals and Cincinnati Bengals Talk. Also has a new book coming out titled Enter the Jungle. He is James Rapine. James, good to talk to you again. Thanks for the time. It's good to see you, Daryl. I appreciate you having me. Good to be seen. Let's jump right in. There is no chance Joe Burrow is not playing on Sunday, correct? Fair. You read my mind. I knew you were going to ask about that. He will uh, be on the field and be starting for the Bengals on Sunday. Hey, take us through that uh, calf injury situation through training camp and how has Burrow looked since he's come back? He looks normal, and I, I think that's the part of this that – it, why they kept us in the dark for so long, whether it was Zach Taylor or, or really anyone inside the building, you had to scratch and claw to get any kind of insider info during Joe Burrow's nearly five week absence. It was a day short of five weeks while dealing with that calf strain. And it's because they had a plan, but they didn't want to certainly jinx it, but they didn't want any type of setback to get in the way. And it, it was scary on July 27th, I think, for a lot of fans, especially when they see Burrow hopping and then he goes down, gets carted off. But within an hour or so, the team knew that it was a uh, not going to be a long-term issue. Now, it was a preseason issue, but it didn't have to be more than that. And so that's why they completely shut him down. He was working out. We saw him throw before – the Bengals preseason opener on, I believe it was August 11th or 12th against the Packers. And so we knew he was doing well. You just didn't know when they were going to bring him all the way back. And I think it's because they didn't want any type of setbacks. They wanted him to be ready to go. And so when he came back on Wednesday of last week, no calf support, no sleeve, there was nothing on that right calf. And I think that was a sign that all systems we're pushing forward towards week one. He's practiced as we record this three times since then has looked the part looks like the normal Joe Burrow that we're used to seeing. And that's what I expect to see on Sunday. I don't expect them to start slow. My expectations are pretty high for number nine. Yeah. Uh, you know, Burroughs might be one and four against the Browns in his uh, young career, but uh, there's a misnomer out there when it comes to that record that he hasn't played well against the Browns. And mm -hmm. That's not true. <laughs> Quite the opposite. He's thrown for nearly 1,500 yards, uh, 10 touchdowns, five picks, got a completion percentage of over 66 uh, in those five games. Um, but what is it about the Browns that seems to be his kryptonite? Because he beats everybody else in the AFC. And I, I, I think Cleveland's really one of the very few teams that he's below 500 against for his career. The, the first two games of his career, it, it was – him trying to drag the Bengals to victory against the Browns. And the Browns clearly had the better roster. And so that's that's where I would start. You know, that Thursday night game back in 2020, he was 37 of 61. I mean, asking a rookie four days into his career to throw 61 times on the road against Miles Garrett, like it's just brutal. I mean, it was their best option, but it was brutal circumstances. Right. The reason this has become a thing is because he did get off to that 0-2 start but the, the two games after that, he struggled. The Denzel Ward interception game, Baker Mayfield, Odell Beckham Jr. gets traded. Baker Mayfield plays really, really well. And in the Browns blow out the Bengals. And then last Monday night uh, on Halloween, we know how that one turned out, 32 to 13. So I think it's the past couple that have really cemented that home and hammered it home. And so, yeah, I think that narrative, if he goes out there week one, struggles, and, and this offense doesn't look – the way people expect it to look. And I get it's going to be challenging against the tough Browns defense that, that has a lot of new faces, obviously new defensive coordinator. But if the Bengals offense doesn't play well, I think this narrative will continue on whether Joe Burrow or people here in Cincinnati like it or not. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, these two teams face off to begin this season uh, here on the shores of Lake Erie. And then uh, to end the season uh, next year, uh, will be in Cincinnati. And so this uh, Deshaun Watson v. Joe Burrow, this uh, you know new newly rebuilt Browns defense against that high-powered Cincinnati Bengal offense, ultimately come week 18 could decide this division, right? Certainly. I mean, that's such a, a huge game. And the Bengals going down to, the, the, you know, the past couple of years, it's gone down to the wire where December games have mattered a ton. Now, 
in 2021, they had nothing to gain. So when they went up to Cleveland for that finale, they rested Joe Burrow and got ready for the playoffs. But I don't think that's going to be the case. This AFC North is tough. It's really tough. I think it's the best division in the NFL. There's probably going to be multiple teams in the mix for one of the top seeds, not just playoff wise, but hoping to win the division and eke it out. So yeah, I think that week 18 game could be really uh, a deciding factor in the division, certainly in the AFC playoff race. In the other part of this, at least for the Bengals, it's Browns on the road. Then you welcome the Ravens at home next week. So back-to-back AFC North opponents, they were three and three in the division last year. I think they're going to have to fare better than that if they're going to win the division for a third straight season. Uh, No Kleenex coming your way. The Browns have to open against the Bengals at home. Then they get to go to Pittsburgh. In fact, uh, three of their first four games are all against the AFC North. Then they have their bye week. Four of their first five games are at at home, which means they get four more home games the rest of the way. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be real challenging uh, for the Browns. James Rapine, he is the publisher of uh, All Bengals as well as Cincinnati Bengals Talk. Also, uh, if you are a Bengals fan and I don't know why you're listening to this particular podcast, but if you're a Bengals fan, James has a brand new book out called Enter the Jungle. Real quick, just to give folks an opportunity, where can they find that uh, particular book and when does it hit store shelves? CincinnatiBengalsBook.com. It's going to be everywhere. Books are sold on September 12th. If you're international, because I'm sure there's a lot of international Bengals fans watching and listening, you can get it on Amazon. Very good. So uh, let, let's get back to uh, this Cincinnati Bengal offense. We talked a little bit about Joe Burrow, where he's at. He's got the three-headed monster, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, uh, Tyler Boyd, um, obviously here in Cleveland. A lot of concern about Denzel Ward and his status for uh, Sunday. Not real optimistic from my standpoint. Uh, in Berea, though, they are uh, preaching the optimism a, a little bit, and uh, I don't know if that's a, a legit or if it's a little bit of a you know sandbagging or whatever, but Bottom line is this Browns defense is going to have a uh, real difficult time uh, with this Cincinnati Bengal passing attack. Take us through the the preseason. What did you observe uh, from that passing game? How do they look? And uh, how much sleep should Browns fans be uh, losing heading into this game, knowing that they got to try and slow down those three prolific receivers? Well, that's that's the Bengals' bread and butter. And I think that's why this has been kind of a tougher matchup for for the Bengals. They want to throw a lot, and the Browns have – a high-end corner, one of the best cornerbacks in the league in Denzel Ward, and one of the best pass rushers in the league in Miles Garrett. And so, yeah, we'll see on Ward, but it, it's been a tough matchup. Now, what I think is really going to be interesting in this game is how Jonah Williams and Orlando Brown Jr., Jonah now at right tackle, Orlando Brown Jr., obviously their big free agency signing, how they fare at the tackle spots against Garrett. Because if you can just not allow him to wreck the game, Joe Burrow is going to be able to find an open receiver. And I think these, this receiving core is as good as it's been, and not just with the big three. Obviously, Jamar Chase, just 23 years old, I think he's poised for maybe his best season. T. Higgins might have a career year as well. But the guys behind them, Trent Nero, when they have a lot of confidence in, Andre Yosevash, I think you might see some of him, number 80, on Sunday as well on offense. So they're deep at receiver. They're going to play three receivers a ton. And they have a new tight end as well, Irv Smith Jr., who I think they believe can add a different element that they didn't get from C.J. Uzama, that they didn't get from Hayden Hurst in in recent years. So we will see if that part happens. He's comfortable with Joe Burrow, he said, even though they haven't practiced much. So there's some wrinkles in there with this offense. But I I think it's a tough test because you have Jim Schwartz. You obviously have a, a tough matchup on paper anyways. It's a tough test early on for this Bengals offense. You alluded to that rebuilt uh, Bengal offensive line. This is the second straight off season in which they have really uh, spent to try and address it because let's be honest about it. Joe Burrow for the first few years of his career was treated like a pinata back there, uh, even though he has played extremely well and uh, at, at an elite level. Um, what impact uh, are they expecting that just the additional loan of Orlando Brown signing him to that big contract in free agency, how transformative of that is, uh, do they expect that particular addition to be for them up front? I think they expect this offensive line to be the best it's been. Certainly in the Joe Burrow era, you could say Zach Taylor era. I'll go even farther back to 2015 when they had Andrew Whitworth and Kevin Zeitler, and they were one of the best offensive lines in the game. And they started eight and with Andy Dalton and AJ Green, 
I think they expect that offensive or this offensive line to be comparable to that one. Now, does that mean Ode- uh, Orlando Brown Jr. is perfect? No, he, he's not. But they think he's a perfect fit for what they want. And I think that's the interesting part of this is they run a lot of quick game. And just having the luxury of potentially calling a five-step drop here and there, here or there, a longer developing play here or there. They haven't been able to do that. They couldn't do that during the Super Bowl run at all. It was three steps and you better let it go. Throw that go ball to Jamar right now or get rid of it quick. If Burrow has just a little bit more time, he's going to make this offensive line look really, really good. They're bringing all three interior linemen back from last year. Like I said, Jonah Williams moved to right tackle. And that's the transformation that Orlando Brown Jr. gives you because I think they look at it as he's clearly the best left tackle Joe Burrow's ever had. And it's going to make everybody else from Cordell Volson, the left guard on down to Jonah Williams at right tackle that much better. Certainly would be remiss if I didn't mention Joe Mixon, uh, who uh, mm-hmm. is fantastic coming out of that backfield, a very tough uh, runner to bring down similar in that regard uh, to, to Nick Chubb, whom the Bengals will be trying to stop on Sunday. But when you look at this offense, right, uh, you know, this year, the Browns with Deshaun and having him for a full off season, they have been able to tweak and, and really draw the playbook to accentuate what he does best as a quarterback. When you've watched this Bengal offense, how uh, different is it from maybe what we saw last year? I think you'll see some differences and play action would be one. I think they're confident enough in this offensive line that they can run some play action and Burrow will have the time to one, be able to scan the defense after turning his back to the defense. That was part of why they ran so much of the LSU style stuff. Obviously Burrow's comfortable with that, but if he's not turning his back, he can see the defenders coming at him because the offensive line (laughs) struggled in pass protection. As basic as it sounds, I think that was a big part of it. So I think more play action, you could see some RPO stuff, which worked last year, but I think they know their identity. And, and it took about halfway through the season. That Cleveland game on Halloween was a big one because they found their identity and it's power run game. And they're going to, to pass block at, at a high level. And, and if they can do that, and they were able to find uh, kind of their groove midway through last year. I, so I think we'll stick with a lot of that. But the, the one big change I expect from this offense, five step drops, uh, longer developing place, if you can, if you feel confident. And maybe that won't happen on Sunday against a really good pass rush. But I think throughout the season that could develop. And the other part of it is the play-action game, which has been pretty non-existent during Joe Bur- Burrow's tenure. I-, I think that changes some this season. Want to flip to the defense side of the ball. So who's replacing your two safeties down there? Von Bell, Jesse Bates gone. They got a couple of new faces in. Uh, who we uh, who, Who's going to be handling that for uh, Cincinnati? Dax Hill. the the first round pick out of Michigan from last year. So he's going into his second season. He's going to be sort of the bell cow, the Jesse Bates, if you will, of this defense. Um, And and what I mean by that is they're going to play him in that deep safety spot at times, but he's more versatile, I would say, than Bates. I'm not saying he's better, but more versatile. He'll be in the box at times. I could see him guarding a a David Njoku on a snap or two or guarding a receiver at, at the nickel spot because they're, they're really comfortable with his athleticism, his ability uh, to, to move up in the box, for example, and make a tackle on a, a Nick Chubb or someone like that. I think he's a better tackler than Bates was early in his career. So it'll be Dax Hill. And then the other guy is Nick Scott, and he's a veteran, someone that went from seventh-round pick, special teamer in Los Angeles, to a, a starter last year and started during their Super Bowl run. And they're comfortable with him as well in that deep safety role. And then you might see some Jordan Battle out there as well, the – the rookie from Alabama. He's a third round pick. Uh, He's sort of their third safety. I would say that's still to be determined a little bit with Tyson Anderson in the mix as well. But those are the guys that will likely kind of replace what they had with with Bates and Bell. But I think the request from defensive coordinator, Lou Anarumo, what he asks those guys to do, it's going to be a bit different with Vaxel leading the way. So who's a non-household name that Browns fans will have to worry about Sunday? On either side? Of the ball, uh, I, I, for for the bet, yeah, either side of the ball for the Bengals. Who who uh, who are we not familiar with? Do you think can have a tremendous impact for the Bengals? Cam Sample, defensive lineman, number ninety six, was really really good uh, this preseason and throughout training camp. He lines up on the edge. They can put him at that defensive tackle spot, that three tech spot. Some so that would be one guy. Another Zachary Carter, also lining up at that three tech spot, number ninety five. He's a second year player out of Florida. One of those two guys. They need someone to emerge there 
uh, on the interior as this interior pass rusher alongside DJ Reader and Trey Hendrickson and obviously Sam Hubbard. Uh, so those are two guys that that could potentially be in the mix that could maybe make an impact on Sunday. And and last one for you, James. Again, thanks so much for the time, James Rapine. Um, when what are they saying down in the Queen City about the Cleveland Browns? Because nationally, right now, the Browns are pretty much under the radar, which is real interesting considering all the moves that Andrew Barry had made this off season. And a couple of them were some pretty splashy moves with Elijah Moore getting you know the the other trade they made for Zadarius Smith, but. Not a, it, it seems like the national media is real reluctant to to really jump all in on the Cleveland Browns here in 2023. I think mostly because they've been burned in years past by putting those expectations on the Browns. So what are the Bengals saying uh, about uh, this Cleveland Browns football team? I certainly think they see the talent. And there's there's an obvious unknown at defensive coordinator to a degree. I mean, obviously, Jim Schwartz has been in the league a long time. He's well-respected, but what exactly does this defense look like? I think that's interesting, especially when you're going up against a unique offense like the Bengals, where they have a ton of firepower on the outside. But no, I, I think it's it's respect. It's the understanding that they are really talented, that it's going to be a really tough place to play. That's the part that I've harped on all of my platforms and, and will continue to do so. It's going to be rocking up there week one. Like you thought Monday night was crazy. And I get it. They were sort of in it still, but not really last year. They're in it now, and there's expectations up there in Cleveland. And so I, I expect uh, Cleveland Brown Stadium to be bumping on Sunday. So uh, I know I think it's I think it's respect now. Fans wise, I think it's split. Some fans say, "Well, the Browns have to show me something. I can see the talent." Until they do, they just kind of shrug them off. Which I think there are people in Cleveland that do that as well. <laughs> At the same time, I think everyone understands how talented that roster is. James, appreciate the time as always. Tell the folks where they can follow you on your uh, on your platforms. At James Rapine on Twitter, like you mentioned, Enter the Jungle comes out September 12th. You can get it at CincinnatiBengalsBook.com and uh, AllBengals.com is where I will be writing and covering the game on Sunday. It should be a good one, my friend. He is the publisher of All Bengals and Cincinnati Bengals Talk. Our thanks to James Rapine for joining us here on a very bonus special edition of It's Always Game Day in Cleveland.